Okay, so let's start. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you for my colleagues from Libya for inviting me to uh, present uh, this talk. And uh, if you see me pausing sometime, that's when I'm admitting people. So bear with me, please, because I'm organizing and I am presenting. And I can see that people are coming and, and going uh, probably because of the internet. So if you see me pausing, please, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so um, today I will be talking about um, um, uh, neonatal resuscitation of sick newborn. And I didn't say uh, 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 neonatal resuscitation, I said resuscitation of uh, sick newborn babies to, to be more, more inclusive uh, rather than say neonatal resuscitation, but the newborn is a little bit a wider than, than, than neonate. Yeah, so um, that would be hard for me if you keep entering. So I don't know if I should stop and lock people from going in and out because that will be consuming time. So the objectives of this talk is uh, to talk about um, anticipation of resuscitation uh, about the antenatal consult, how, what we do when we see the parent prior delivery, uh, our approach, how we can approach a baby and some interventions that we do. And when we fail and when we discontinue, and uh, uh, when we hold, we don't do resuscitation. And what we do with post-resuscitation will be also giving you some glimpse about golden hours and about gentle care. Okay, so as you know, um, most of you uh, probably um, uh, either certified as uh, instructor or being as a candidate of an RP or other resuscitation program knows that about 10% of babies need some interventions. And during the talk, we will understand what is some intervention and about 1% of newborn babies uh, need intensive kind of resuscitation. Um, so, uh, um, to do that, we need a skilled personnel. That will be very hard for me to present today if you guys keep entering, going in and out. Um, uh, so, we need skilled personnel and, of course, we need equipment. So here is a list of some equipments that we use in a newborn baby. So I'm not going to go details of these equipments. Uh, the reason is it will be time consuming, but then we need some suction equipment. We need equipment to deal with intubation. We need a list of medications such as dextrose and uh, uh, norepinephrine and normal saline and maybe naloxone and some uh, syringes. And we need equipment to arm the baby and we need an additional equipment that is uh, important for a newborn baby. Uh, such as, you know, you provide appropriate uh, blended oxygen. You might need also um, air source. My goodness, I didn't know that the number will reach that level. Anyhow, for preterm babies, we need additional equipment, such as polyethylene bag. It's the same bag that we use. Uh, do you guys hear me? Yes, yes. The, yeah, we hear you. Yeah, so Dr. Osama, everybody's yes. hearing. So the problem is yours. Yes, we have, yes, no problem. Yeah. Um, so uh, we need a polyethylene bag. It's the same bag that we use it for sandwich or we cover the, you know, some uh, frozen meat. We need a skilled personnel, very skilled personnel for intubation. We need surfactant, of course. We need equipment to skin care. Please mute yourself. And we need small sized lines. We need a head cover. We need small diapers. We need transport incubators and, and ventilator and CPAP. Please mute yourself. 
uh, please mute yourself. Uh, we need also radiant warmer, we need oxygen source, we need suction equipment, we need special laryngoscope, we need uh, to test. Please mute yourself. Please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we need also to test this equipment before we come to... Uh, when we do resuscitation, we have to decide whether we attend or we do not attend. And how we do, do that? We, by developing a high-risk deliveries. High-risk deliveries including maternal conditions such as mother with heart disease or mother hypertensive or diabetic or have a renal problem or other problem. Also maybe a fetal condition. Please, Dr. Najat, mute yourself. Um, uh, also, we need uh, uh, some fetal condition that we need uh, as a high delivery, such as being twin or being having um, antenatal uh, malformation or being premature. We have also antipartum complications, such as antenatal bleeding. Dr. Ahuda, the sound is very clear because everybody is hearing you. It's a, your problem. And Dr. Najat, Al Sharif, please mute yourself. I muted you six times now. Dr. Najat, please mute yourself. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so we have antipartum complications such as bleeding, for example, or a mother having a fever. Dr. Najat, please mute yourself. I'm going to take you out of the room. Um, we have also delivery complications such as obstructing, obstructive labor. And sometimes the resuscitation needed after delivery. So we should have something called uh, alarm code or what some people call, call it code blue. Other hospital called you um, um, uh, uh, neonatal code. Other called it pink code and so on. You should have a code for babies who are born in okay and then deteriorated later, later for, for resuscitation. And then from this list, we decide whether to uh, need to attend or, or not. Okay, now as a Britain babies for high risk deliveries, we need a list of equipment, same, almost same of newborn babies, just a newborn or premature babies need extra uh, uh, list. Uh, what are the uh, challenges that is very important in dealing with a preterm infant? First, most people think intubation, but guess what? Intubation is the least important in management of preterm babies. Now the pillars of a good neonatal resuscitation or resuscitation of a preterm baby is controlling temperature, providing adequate ventilation, prevention of infection, and prevention iatrogenic injury causing organ damage, also avoiding hypoglycemia. So what are the pillar of a good premature survival resuscitation? First, antenatal steroid. You know that antenatal steroid, um, the evidence are very clear of RDS, IVH, uh, blood pressure, all these are can be controlled when we do um, antenatal resuscitation. For those who cannot enter the room because we reached the maximum, they can watch it on YouTube. Just go on YouTube, write my name, and then you can see it live. Uh, also, antenatal magnesium sulfate being used now to protect the brain. Uh, uh, the most important point when we do antenatal resuscitation, especially for those below 1500 grams, is controlling the room temperature. The room temperature has to go up between 25 to 27 degrees Celsius. It's very hot for other babies, but because the baby's skin are very uh, exposed, uh, the baby can be dried out, they cannot control the body temperature, can be dehydrated. So raising the, in the room temperature prior to the delivery of a, a premature baby less than 1,500 grams is vital. Delay cordic clamping. Now the evidence are huge of delay cordic clamping. 
early sugar infusion. Remember that the placenta provide to the baby about four to eight milligram per kg per minute of sugar. And remember the brain cannot tolerate fasting without sugar. And remember that newborn babies have no store of sugar because most of the sugar store develop in the third trimester. And therefore, starting sugar early within 10 minutes of life is vital. Intubating a baby and giving surfactant is not important. Starting the sugar is important. Controlling the room temperature is important. Delay cordic clamping is important. Giving caffeine within 20 minutes is more important than uh, giving surfactant. However, there is talk right now that those we use early caffeine might have, although the evidence is not strong, but might have more risk or more incidence of neck necrotizing enterocolitis. I myself never seen it, but the evidence is, you know, going up in this area and going and having, you know, momentum. Um, the other point, early CIPA and achieving functional residual capacity. Remember, without achieving functional residual capacity, you will not get the best benefit of giving surfactant. And you might have a higher... Uh, um... Yeah, so those who cannot enter the room and because the room reached the maximum, they can watch the presentation live on YouTube. And they can ask me on WhatsApp at the end of the session or even on YouTube. You will check before we close if they have questions. So those who cannot enter the room, they can go because we reached the maximum. They can see it on YouTube. The other point, what we call it golden hour, and we will talk about that. The other point is gentle care. Gentle care means doing less invasive, doing less harm, getting best benefit. I will talk about it. Okay, so also before we resuscitate baby, if the time permit, we do antenatal consult. So if I am a parent, what I want to do? No, no. I want to know the survival rate. So depending on the weight, and the gestational age and the performance of your organization, you can give a list of survival rate to the parent. And the, also the parent need to know the course of management. So when, how long this baby will stay? What exactly we will do? The lecture is being recorded. Um, uh, what is the outcome regarding the death or the comorbidities. When we say morbidity, we're talking about major uh, complications, such as being able to talk, being able to see, being able to hear, being able to uh, uh, doing daily routine, attending school, having a job, and so on. We will also provide the parent with a list of complications from CNS, such as apnea and IVH or PVL, respiratory such as chronic lung disease, RDS, GIT such as neck and you know feeding complication, blood such as anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, infection, and of course when to go home and if there is insurance or cash patient, they need to know about the cost. So now we just being talked about a background of how we do resuscitation. And now let's start do the resuscitation. So the first thing with doing resuscitation is to do antenatal consult if the time permit. The second is to uh, uh, check your equipment. Now, most of neonatologists or, or those who work with me, they know that I'm obsessive about checking the equipment. And also we have something called briefing Okay, and debriefing. So briefing, we do it before we do resuscitation. And these are who's the team leader, who will do what, so you assign the role, and um, anybody uh, need help in her or his 
role you need help so you know antenatal also you'll talk about history maybe some important point on social history examination and um, some if this there is a complications or so on whether it's a fetal or maternal or antenatal or natal what is the complication so these are very important three points antenatal consult checking the equipment and team briefing now as you know with nrp uh, edition eight the questions, the question that we ask prior delivery to decide whether uh, we resuscitate or not have been changed many times. So the latest list of questions is we ask, what is the gestation? And when we ask the gestation is term or Britain baby. Also, we ask about whether or not the uh, uh, amniotic fluid is clear or not. Now we ask if the baby already born uh, whether the baby is breathing or crying and not only that we can guess antenatally whether the baby will breathe or will cry we can ask also for additional risk factors such as you know big weight small weight absence diastolic flow um, mother have at risk of infection and, and previous death you know what are additional complications we should have a plan for uh, uh, taking care of the cord, especially delay cord clamping. It is vital for better outcome to do delay cord clamping. And delay cord clamping should be somewhere between 30 seconds to two minutes. Some I know some uh, centers go more than. Please, Dr. Marion, mute yourself. Um, uh, so um, uh, it's, it's, please, Dr. Marion, mute yourself. Um, um, so it's vital to have the anti, please, Dr. Marion, mute yourself, sir. Um, so it's vital to have a list of or, or um, 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 a process or a protocol or a guidelines for the uh, delay cord clamping. And then you ask yourself, is the answer for any of these questions is no, mean the baby is term, the amniotic fluid is clear, uh, the baby is crying or breathing, there is none additional risk. And we have, um, uh, so if the answer is no, then to any of these, then initiate an RP. Or if the answer is yes, then we do not need a resuscitation. And we will go for something called well baby care, or people call it combined care, or the baby being with the mother. So what we what is well baby care include? Delay cord clamping, and then examining a baby within 24 hours by a doctor, doing vaccination, doing circumcision for religious uh, purposes if needed, and some people also do it for uh, medical reason. We do neonatal screening and we establish the feeding. So these are called well baby care. Now, if the answer is no, and we initiate an RP, and then the after initiating an RP, whether the baby will respond to initial steps of resuscitation or not. If the answer is yes, then the baby go to something called monitoring care. So it's not well baby care, it's a monitoring care. It's exactly like the well baby care, but we add few things to it. First, we check the vital signs, you know, the respiratory rate, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the saturation, every two to four hours. And we may also do sugar check. We may check the gas and we might do sepsis workup. So that's called monitoring care. So remember, we have well baby care, and then we have monitoring care. Now, if the answer is no, we go to intensive care. And intensive care mean monitoring, mean central lines, mean respiratory support, mean incubator, mean an ICU admission. So this is the algorithm of the eighth edition of an RP, and we will go through it. So now we decided to resuscitate or not, we know the packet ground, we have our list, we have our equipment, we are assigned the role, we have the team, they are skilled, everything is there on place, the setting, everything, now we will start with resuscitation. Now the resuscitation in an RB comp composed of blocks of time. 
each block is 30 seconds. So they are cycles or blocks or black bond, whatever the name you want to do. And these blocks are 30 seconds. They are, in, they are composed of assessment and action. And if you look at the NRB algorithm, each step or each part of these have a shape. So they can be uh, rectangular or square or uh, uh, diamond shape that you can see. So these cycles is 30 seconds and it composed of assessment and action. And each block composed of three parts. You evaluate, you identify, then you intervene. Again, it composed of assessment and action. It's a 30 second and it composed of evaluation, identify and intervene. And each one of them has a shape on the algorithm of NRP. When we do it every 30 second, not only that, before and after any intervention we do. So, we did the antenatal consult. We have the equipment checked. We did meet with the team. We do the briefing. Now the baby is born. We ask our questions, which are the four questions in the addition eight of NRB, the gestational age, the uh, 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 color of the fluid, additional risk factor, and delay cord plumbing. If the answer is yes, mean that the baby has no any issues, we go to, well, as we said, we or to the routine care. What's co the composition of routine care? First, we need to keep the body temperature of the baby. So we can do uh, skin to skin, kangaroo care. We rub the baby, we do we use towels. We position the airway. We clear the secretion if needed. We dry the baby, we do ongoing evaluation. The baby is with mom. There should be delay cardiac clamping. We establish a breastfeeding and we do examination within 24 hours of life. We also do vaccination and circumcision if needed. That is called routine care. Now, if the answer is no, we initiate an RP. And you can see the NRP composed the same of these, but we don't do the extra step, but we add to it stimulation. So the, after the four questions, the routine care, exactly the first step of uh, if you remember that evaluation, and then evaluation in the first step is asking four questions, then you identify a problem, there is no problem, you go for routine care, or you identify there is a problem, you initiate an RP. And the first step of an RP is provide warning as here, position as here, clear secretion as here, dry as here, but in an RP you add stimulation. And remember between ID, uh, assessment, identification and intervention, a block of 30 seconds. Okay, so now let's go to details of the first step, uh, you know, step by step of the first step. So, and then we decide who is qualified for routine care. Well, a baby who's done, a baby who has a clear amniotic fluid, a baby who has no additional factor, and a baby whose the uh, 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 umbilical cord plant is already in place which means the baby has good tone, um, baby is crying and breathing without difficulty. And remember, the baby does not need to cry. It is not necessary to cry. And it's not necessary to see the baby breathing very well. You just check the heart rate. If the heart rate is more than 100, then nothing else needed. Um, there is no maternal risk factor, there is no delivery risk factor, and there is no fetal risk factors. Of all these there, then the baby is qualified for routine care. And routine care is the same of first step, but without stimulation, in addition to other measure that we do after uh, resuscitation or after delivery, sorry. Now who infant who required a further resuscitation? Now, any baby who is not tan, that's mean pre-tan, if the fluid is not clear, so meconium or turban, 
if there is any additional risk factors. Or with, with the required care, we also should have umbilical cord management plan. So you can see the umbilical cord management plan is there with the routine and with initiation of uh, resuscitation. So in short, any baby who failed the criteria for routine care is uh, 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 qualified for uh, initiation of an RP. Okay, so the few first few steps of resuscitations, as we uh, talk, uh, whether it's uh, uh, initiation of an RP or it's a routine care, it's the same, but in initiation of our disease, we do stimulation. So the first one is to provide warming the baby to keep the body temperature normal, to prevent hypothermia. So we can swaddle the baby, we can wrap the baby by towels. And usually we wrap the baby by three or four towels on the ground. So we wrap, we dry the baby, and then we remove until the baby is dried well, and then you swaddle the baby with the last uh, towel. We can do skin to skin with the mother between the breast. We can uh, use a polyethylene bag or plastic bag to wrap the baby or enclose the baby in the plastic to prevent evaporation, dehydration, and change in temperature in babies less than 1500 grams. We can use warming pads. These pads can be um, uh, chemical, so um, like phase change variables, if you know, guys know what is phase change variables. So these are usually um, uh, normal until you do something such as you break it and it become hot or it can be, become cold, it depends on the type. So we can use warming pads, we can use chemical, we can use also electricals. We can use a premium radiant warmer such as the Ohio, and when the baby need oxygen, it should be humidified and heated to prevent, also to, prov to provide warming. So the first step is to provide warming. The second step is positioning. So the baby should be positioned in a correct place, or they call it sniffing position. Sniffing mean that the tip of the nose, and the tip of the chin is at the same level. And it's exactly when you uh, introduce your face to sniff. So when you do like this, okay, that is the sniffing position. Why it's important? Because it keep all the airway aligned in one, 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 one plane and they are open. So avoid hyperflexion or avoid hyperextension. Both, it will be block the airway, whether upper or lower. So you need to align all the upper airway in one plane to keep the airway patent. To achieve that, the baby should be flat on the pack. Rarely, you might need a shoulder roll. And again, the tip of the nose and the tip of the chain should be on same horizontal level. And therefore you align all the upper airway in one plane being patent. So we dried and now we position. So remember, very important to remember, very important point. Remember, first, always support the head. No need to make the head below the body. The head should be always above the body. So first, support the head, not the neck support the head, because the head is almost 40% of the body uh, weight. So remember, always support the head. You don't need to put the head down and the body up. The head should be always above the body. 
never ever carry the baby from leg. So these are important points in uh, 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 positioning the baby. Now, if somebody asks you why it's not, why it's very important not to carry the, the baby from the leg. First, it might cause IVH. Second, it might cause dislocation. Third, and if you look at the evidence, carrying the baby from leg cause persistent back egg all the life. And it has a zero benefit. In addition, the head, so if you do bridge suspension or if you do bungee jump, if you are you know, a, a, a sport that you do bungee jump, you will see that when you do the jump, bungee jump and when you go up and down, the blood goes to your brain. But remember that your head, uh, about 10% of your body weight. But remember, in newborn baby, the head is 40% of the body weight. So it is vital not to carry the leg, baby from leg, especially our colleagues from obstetric and nursing department. The big problem in resuscitation, suctioning. So suction is not necessary. Suction is not part of resuscitation. There is no need to suction if the baby is breathing. Suction should be always done after drying the baby, controlling body temperature, and positioning the baby. Suction is only the mouth and the nose. Suction should be by bulb syringe, and you should be trained how to use it. And it can be by mechanical suction. You suction the mouth, then the nose. Do not suction the esophagus or the stomach. There is no need, even if the baby heart rate is zero even if the baby in respiratory distress. There is no need to suction the stomach and esophagus. So remember, suctioning the stomach and the esophagus delay resuscitation, stimulate vagus nerve, cause organ damage, cause bleeding, and remove, remove an important body fluid. And it has zero benefit. So when I suction beyond the nose and the mouth, when there is airway obstruction, that's mean there is a breathing, but there is no air entry. Second, when you intubate and you cannot see the larynx, that's the only indication of suctioning beyond the nose and the mouth. So again, suctioning is not part of resuscitation. There is no need to, to suction. It delay resuscitation, it stimulate the vagus nerve, it cause organ damage, it cause bleeding and remove, remove an important body fluid. It can provide nutrition. Even if there is blood, you don't need to suction. Suctioning beyond the nose and the mouth is only indicated when the baby is breathing, but there is no air entry. And you can see that there is obstruction of the upper airway after correct position, after drying and after uh, controlling body temperature. And the other indication is when you want to intubate, but the secretion is blocking your view to put your ETT to uh, cannulate the larynx and the trachea. Drying. How we dry? We use a clear pre-warm sheet. We use more than one and we replace. So we put four, for example, we start to use the up one, the first one, clear the baby. So you now you carry one is carrying the baby and the other one throw the uh, wet one. And then you go to the second one clean the baby and then remove the baby, take up the baby, 
remove the second one and then until you dry um, and then you swaddle or wrap the baby with uh, the last one. So we warm the baby, we position the baby, we clear the secretion, we dry the baby, and now we stimulate the big other problem in resuscitation. So these are big problem. Holding, how to hold the baby, suction, another point is stimulation. Remember that if you have a strong person, you need to hit him hard. But if you have a, um, I, I think I've, I've misspelling this. If you have a weak person, now you need to, to hit that person gently. You don't need to hit a weak person hardly. So remember, if the baby is not breathing, harsh, strong, ungentle stimulation will not help. So remember when you stimulate, gentle. You can slap or flick the saw. And when you do that, you read it also two or three times, nothing more than. And then you rub the back of the baby. When you do racking is up and down two or three times, nothing more than that. You can also stroke the sole, or you can stroke even the thumb or the big toe. Never carry the baby from the leg. Always support the head. So remember, never carry the baby from the leg. This is the respected Dr. Virginia Abgar, who um, uh, discovered the Abgar score. She passed away a few years ago, and you can see how she's carrying the baby. This is wrong. So or wrong stimulation, carrying the baby from leg, squeezing the chest, rubbing the chest, rubbing the abdomen, hit the back of the baby, like in the movies. I don't want to mention the names of them. There is no need for the baby to cry. You do not need to hit the baby to cry. You just need to check the heart rate. And then you do gentle stimulation. If the baby is not breathing, the baby need ventilation, not stimulation. Stimulation should not be more than two to three times. So what is good neonatologist? Be gentle and patience. Gentle and patience. Good non-genetologist does not mean that he or she knows how to intubate. That is not a good intubate. Good neonatologist who is able to avoid intubation. Okay, so, so far we are still in the first step of resuscitation. We asked our four questions. We decided yes, we did routine care. We decided no, we did the first step of an RP. So we identify, we uh, um, assess, we identify, and then we intervene. Okay, now we go to the second step of resuscitation. And remember, it's again 30 seconds. So now we are in the second 30 second, approaching one minute. So first we do assessment as usual, and you look, it's a diamond. So here we do uh, 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 at breathing and heart rate only. Is there is apnea? Is there is gasping? And we check the heart rate. We don't need to count the heart rate. We just need to know below or above 100. That's all. And if the baby is not apneic and not gasping and his heart rate more than 100, or, uh, then we need, is the baby labored breathing or have color change? If yes, we go to the second step of resuscitation. If the answer is no, mean the baby responded to first step of resuscitation. And in a, so instead of routine care, we go to monitoring care. If the baby is not responding, whether in this line or in this line, then we go to the second step of resuscitation. So again, we finish first step, then we go, uh, we initiate an RP, we started first step, 30 seconds, now we do assessment for second step. So we ask, is there is apnea? 
is there is gasping with the heart rate less than 100. So if the heart rate is more than 100, if there is no apnea, no gasping, we ask ourselves if there is labored breathing, that means the baby is in distress, or there is color change. If the answer again is no, then that means the baby responded to the first step of the station, which is the routine care plus stimulation, and then we go to monitoring care. If the answer is no, yes, there is apnea, or yes, there is gasping, or yes, the heart rate less than 100, we do second step of action, or the action of the second step. If there is labor or cyanosis, mean the baby needs support. So if the answer is yes here, we do PPV or positive pressure ventilation. We check our saturation and we check our heart rate. And remember, heart rate is checked not by palpation, not palpating the umbilical cord, not putting the hand on the chest, not using a stethoscope. It is by ECG. And if there is no ECG, then the best second option is stethoscope, not palpating. If the baby is not apneic and not gasping and heart rate more than 100, but you have a labored breathing or cyanosis, then you need to make baby position. You need to make sure that you clear up airways uh, by positioning and maybe suctioning if needed. Now you need to provide oxygen. And I hate the word oxygen. Oxygen should not be given to human being. We should give a blended oxygen. oxygen blended with medical air and it should be heated and humidified. Here we might consider SIPA also when the baby had no apnea, no gasping and the heart rate more 100, but he or she is labored or have a color change. Okay, so now we are in the second step of resuscitation. Let's go to step by step of the second step. Remember apnea, gasping on heart rate. So what's apnea? Apnea is cessation of breathing less than 20 seconds. Now, what is the evidence? There is no evidence of this definition. It's just by convention. Or cessation of breathing less than 20 seconds associated with decreased heart rate or cyanosis. So what is decreased heart rate? Less than 100. Cyanosis, um, as you know, cyanosis will not occur until the hemoglobin, the carboxyhemoglobin is five grams. So if the baby is 15 grams, total hemoglobin and five grams needed to show the saturation, uh, to show the cyanosis mean five out of 15 is about 33%. That means the saturation will drop to 77% or 67% uh, before cyanosis appear. So this is a very late sign and that's not a good resuscitation to wait for cyanosis. So you should, connect the baby to the monitor and look saturation and look to the desaturation way ahead of uh, cyanosis. So again, cyanosis, the carboxy hemoglobin should be five grams. So let's say your hemoglobin is 20, then five out of 20 is 25%, which means the baby saturation will be 75 before you see cyanosis. If the hemoglobin is 15, so five out of 15 is 33%, which means the saturation should be 67 before you see cyanosis. So the cyanosis is actually a very late sign. Okay, so assessment of the second step, apnea. We defined apnea. Gasping. Gasping is occasional breathing. And then you see the chest moving, but there is no air entry. That means there is, or there is poor air entry. That means there is movement, but there is no exchange of gases. There is no giving oxygen and there is no taking CO2. This is one of the indication after positioning, you might need suctioning. And then heart rate. So here you don't need to count the heart rate. You just need to say above 100 or below 100. So how do you do that? Either you count over six seconds or 10 seconds. If you count over six seconds, multiply it by 10. If you count over 10 seconds, multiply it by six. And then tell the others heart rate above or below 100. Because if it's above 100, and then you look to is it labored or cyanosis? If no, you go to routine care. If it's below 100, then you need the second step of NRP. So cyanosis 
is blue discoloration of skin and sclera when the carboxyhemoglobin is five grams. It can be central. Um, so when we do resuscitation, we are talking about central, not the peripheral or the acrocyanosis. Labored breathing mean difficulty in breathing. So what is labored breathing? You see suprasternal, intercostal, substernal, head nodding, uh, sternal uh, recession. Okay, and the baby is struggling for breathing. So the baby is using accessory muscle. So now we did the apnea, the gasping, the heart rate, the labor breathing, the cyanosis. Now we take action. Okay, so first we provide oxygen. So oxygen you provided temporarily. You cannot provide oxygen more than a few minutes. So if you persistently need oxygen, it should be blended oxygen. So we can use simple mask, and I'm not in a, in a, in a, in a situation to discuss what is simple mask. Uh, I wish, and I hope you guys know. And if not, then you can ask me later. I can answer by texting. You can use nasal cannula. You can use flow inflation bag. You can use cup or use your hand, and it's preferred to use air oxygen blending from the beginning. And if you are not, then within a few minutes, you should switch from pure oxygen to uh, blended. Remember, human being breathe only 21%. Human being cannot, even adult, you cannot give the pure oxygen. And when you see in the TV, for management of COVID-19 by giving oxygen is incorrect and it's inhuman. And it's one of the causes of deterioration of the patient because human have no scavengers. Human cannot remove radicals caused by oxygen. And radicals, uh, it, it called, I think, hemoperxine. I, I forget the name or the, the name of the of the of the excavenger of the removal of the of the radicals. It stays there and causes inflammation in the lung, in the heart, in the brain, in the bowel. So you cannot provide oxygen from a bottle to a human being. The oxygen should be blended with air and should be humidified. And if you need oxygen more than forty percent for more than 15 minutes, you have to escalate your respiratory support. So remember that, please. And when you need oxygen, please position, clear airway, and consider SIPA. So you can provide, as I say, by symbol mask, you can provide it by nasal cannula, and I don't have to, time to explain these. Uh, you can use flow inflation bag, and I prefer it actually to use flow inflation bag, or what we call it, anesthesia bag. We can use cup like, we can use a corrugate tube like here. We, and remember, we have to use air, oxygen, air blender. And remember that oxygen is always white and air always black, whether the tube or the hole in the wall. So, and it should be blended. So you should use oxygen as less as possible and medical air as high as possible. But if you need more than two liters, especially more than four, you don't need blended oxygen. It's better to use CPAP because remember, CPAP is a flow, the speed of the flow. So if you need flow more than four, you probably need CPAP. The reason is because when you give more than four flow, you're already providing CPAP, but unmeasured. While when you provide CPAP, you are providing flow, but with measured CPAP. So remember, we need flow more than four to achieve oxygen less than 40%, then probably you have to switch to SIPA. Um, you can use um, you know, SIPA, and there's many SIPA. We have the continuous um, uh, or constant uh, 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 continuous airway pressure. Uh, that is the or co constant CPAP. We have the flow variable CPAP. So we have constant flow CPAP. We have the variable flow CPAP and we have the bubble CPAP. So for long term is the best to use variable flow CPAP. And also I don't have time to explain what is variable flow CPAP, but also we can answer the question on the side talk or by texting. So you can also provide positive pressure ventilation. You can use the flow inflation bag. 
You can use self-inflation bank. You can use the T piece. You can use the new above. You can also use the uh, Ohio. And when you do PPV, you should provide 40 to 60 event or squeeze or pressure per time. Once you need PPV, it is must to have oxygen saturation monitor and you should have ECG prop on the chest. So this is the flow inflation bag you can provide. You can provide oxygen, but you can provide PPV. And this is the uh, self inflation bag you can use. Uh, you can see you can add to it oxygen. You can use reservoir with it to provide better, a higher percentage of oxygen, and you have different size. You can see there is relieving uh, or pop-up valve, pop-up valve that to prevent higher pressure, to prevent less air injury. You can see mask. This is not preferred mask for newborn babies. The newborn babies should be a, a, a circular mask, not a mask with notch, and it's preferred to have a cushion, and the cushion can be inflated by air or by the uh, fluid, and that will prevent the um, uh, mark on the skin or uh, resuscitation injury. You can use the TPS with Neobuff, so you can use the TPS here with the Neobuff, and also you can use the TPS with the resuscitate. And how you do? So you do um, uh, uh, one and two and breathe, one and two and breathe, or breathe two and three, breathe and two and three. So when you do that. Uh, you actually provide somewhere between 40 to 60 uh, um, uh, event per minute. So you do one and two and breathe and squeeze, one and two and three and squeeze, one and two and three and squeeze, one and, or two and three and squeeze, two and three and squeeze. So if you do one, you're probably giving 40. If you remove one, you're probably doing 60. So both are correct, but you need to do somewhere between 40 to 60. When you start giving oxygen in a term baby, start with room air, 21%. Remember, oxygen is dangerous. If you are premature less than 30 weeks, you probably might start at 30%. And if you, your air is, you know, their saturation is okay, uh, according to the target that we will talk about, target oxygenation, then you probably you need to win. And if you cannot win and you need oxygen more than 30%, like let's say 40% for more than 15 minutes, you probably need to escalate your respiratory support. So once you do PBV, you need to check saturation and it's best to check it uh, between uh, on the right hand. Now it's here written 88 to 91, you know, probably this is uh, better to make it 90 to 94 and in term baby. Um, so I would change this number 90 to 94 instead of this because it, they found that this, you know, going uh, saturation below 90 probably associated with increased risk of death, um, but between 90 and 94 associated with less risk of death, but more ROP. But I think, um, you know, um, death is 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 um, a bigger risk than an ROP. So I would um, change this number to 90 to 94 and above 94 for a term baby. Once you do. Uh, uh, second step, you probably need ECG to check the heart rate. And uh, once you need PPV, then you need to check your heart rate. Once you um, provide oxygen, you need to check your heart rate by chest lead. So again, this is the algorithm. So we finish the first step and we finish the second step. So first step, second step. So both of them are one minute. So these are if the baby respond after the second step, then probably you need the um, uh, 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 to go for intensive care. Now, when you look at your saturation and you're doing respiratory support, whether by PPV or CPAP, um, either way you have to achieve your target saturation depending on the gestational age. So when the baby is one minute, the saturation between 60 and 65. You do not need to give oxygen more than 30% if the saturation is 60 at one minute. And if it's 70 at two minutes, and if it's 75 at three minutes, remember oxygen is dangerous. So please look at your target in the NRB algorithm. So we did our first step because of apnea or gasping or heart rate uh, uh, below 100 or we gave CPAP because we have labor breathing or changing color. If the baby is responding, and how we know the baby responding after 
the second step on third assessment. Here we assess only one thing, heart rate. Is it above 100 or below 100? If you have ECG, then you look at it. If you don't count it by stethoscope, either for six minutes, over six seconds, or 10 seconds, depend on how urgent the situation. If over six seconds, multiply it by 10. Sec uh, 10. And if you are uh, over 10 seconds, multiply it by six. So if the answer is no, the heart rate is above 100, then um, uh, please go to post resuscitation debriefing and intensive uh, care. If the heart is yes, so once you assess and you're using PPV or CPAP, please check your chest movement. And if there is chest movement, make sure that there is air entry. And if there is air, no air entry, make sure that the position is correct. Upper airway is clear from any fluid or debris. And if oath, check for pneumothorax, whether by uh, transillumination or using lung ultrasound, or you know, by listening and expecting. When there is a more problem here, always consider giving intubating the trachea. And if you don't cannot, you can use laryngeal mask airway. So we are in the, after the heart rate, and our heart rate is less than 100. So we have to check chest movement. We have to check for air entry. We have to check for pneumothorax and we have to consider either ETT or uh, laryngeal mask airway. So these are laryngeal mask airways, and now it's available in different size depending on the gestation. So the baby on the third step, the heart rate is more than 100. So now we have to go for intensive care and you do post, you remember we did briefing, now we do debriefing. So the debriefing is important for next resuscitation. So we say what went well and what we can improve. And what is the staff feeling about the communication? So if you do resuscitation and you can monitor the team and you can, if you wanna record them and then tell them how they, you can see during resuscitation, your behaviors, your tone, your communication skills, your anger, your temper. So the staff have to be clear about this. So if a staff felt insulted, or felt that being communicated with some rudeness between the nurses, the doctors, the respiratory therapist, the reception, the obstetrician, the midwife, resuscitation nurse, all should communicate clearly if the baby responded to first or second step of resuscitation or what we call it post resuscitation debriefing. If the heart rate Less than 100, now we go to the resuscitation after one minute. We check the chest in air, we check the chest movement, ascultate the chest for entry, pneumothorax, consider intubation. If we did this step, and remember now we are one minute plus 30 seconds. So at 90 seconds, we again check the heart rate. Now the check the heart rate is three. The result should be three. Below 60, between 60, and 100 above 100. So after this, if the uh, uh, heart rate above 100, after we did this, then we go to post resuscitation debriefing. If the heart rate between 60 and 100, we continue in this area. We recycle again and again, we stay here and we call for expert if we don't know what's going on. If the heart rate below 60, now we continue same, but we do chest compression. And when we do chest compression, we have to coordinate it with PPV. In this situation, we give 100% oxygen and it's preferred to be blended. But does that mean you have a chest compression and you say, Dr. Yahya said, we have to provide blended and you don't have blended. You have to provide here when the baby heart rate less than 60, you have to provide 100% right away. Of course, when your heart rate is at 60, you have to have a cardiorespiratory monitor and consider venous access 
And the best and the easiest is to have a UVC high level or low level, sorry. So how we coordinate chest compression, chest massage with PPV, we do two types. We have thumb technique and we have the two finger technique. And remember some people have short and long fingers so they can bend. They don't need to be straight because their hand will be bent. So when you do two finger technique, you can bend the, length, long, the long finger. Okay, and when you do that, you're obliged to give only 40 and about 60 of chest compression. So the events between chest compression and breathing should be around 120. Okay, and it should be, you know, per minute. So how we do that, we do, for example, two and three and breathe. So when we say two and three, two and three and breathe, two and three, we compress the chest. And, and here we release the bag of the PPV. So compression with releasing, releasing the chest and compression. So one and two and three and breathe, one and two and three and breathe. And the best, the person who's doing the chest compression do the counting. So he can see one and then, or two, whatever he likes, and then compress. So two and, so two and compression and three and compression and breathe. So one and two and breathe or two and three and breathe, two and three and three and breathe, two and three and breathe, two and three and breathe, two and three. And then you can coordinate between, um, if you are alone, then you do chest compression and then you do breathing by two thumb technique. And if you are, uh, sorry, two fingers technique. And if you are two, then it's the best way to thumb technique. The one who's doing the chest compression should be either from the side or at the leg of the baby. And the one who's doing uh, the ventilation or PPV either from the head of the baby or from the other side. Um, you know, the chest compression again should be coordinate with the breathing. And so you can see this one, the person is standing from the leg and the ventilating person is standing from the head. Again, another way of coordinating um, breathing, no breathing. <laughs> breathing, not breathing, breathing, not breathing. And during non breathing, you do the chest compression. Again, this is the algorithm that we are working. And now we are here. If we do chest compression and we establish our ventilation, most of the time when you reach this point, you are already intubated. If we do chest compression after uh, 30 seconds and the heart rate still six, less than 60, you continue chest compression, but consider medication, consider hypovolemia and consider pneumothorax. Epinephrine, now the dose has been changed uh, before uh, it was arranged between 0.01 to 0.03 milligram per kg or 0.1 to 0.3 mL of one in 10,000. So before, as we um, looked at the NRP, it has been changed to 0.02. So there will be no range in the NRP edition eight, not like the NRP edition seven. So instead of a range from 0.01 to 0.03, now the dose is 0.02, the fixed. And it's only for babies when the heart rate less than 60 were already established chest compression for at least 30 seconds, and there should be effective ventilation. And if you want to give the ETT dose, same dose, just multiply it by three. So how we do post resuscitation? So remember, we have three types of resuscitation or care post resuscitation. Well, baby care, if the baby responding to initial step of resuscitation. Monitoring care, if the baby respond to the second step of resuscitation. And intensive care, if the baby not responded to the second step of resuscitation.
So when we say intensive care, mean an expert person dealing with the baby for postnatal care, mean transfer to an ICU, mean respiratory support, mean cardiorespiratory support, and mean initial course of care in the nursery. And we already talked about well baby care or combined care and monitoring care. So what is post or who need the post respiratory care? If the baby has apnea and gasping and the heart rate less than 100, if the baby having labored breathing or cyanosis, if the heart rate less than 60. Pulse resuscitation care means starting sugar and fluid. Pulse resuscitation care, you might need CPAP or caffeine. You need lines and you might consider surfactant, intubation and mechanical ventilation. So you can see that surfactant is not emergency medication and surfactant is not part of resuscitation. So this is important to remember. Surfactant is not emergency. You do not need to give surfactant at labor room. It's not part of resuscitation. And best when we give surfactant in a controlled situation, less complication from surfactant if we give it in a controlled situation. And the best, and according to events, we do early rescue or the giving surfactant between 30 and 20, 120 minutes. And people ask me, why not before? Because you need to achieve functional residual capacity before you're giving surfactant. You need to start sugar before giving surfactant. You need to control the temperature before giving surfactant. Why we fail? because we have a blockage of the upper airway, so we need to open it, or the lung is not working because pneumothorax or effusion or diaphragmatic hernia or hypoplasia or pneumonia or RDS, or it might have a heart problem. Or if you have persistent low, think about heart block. Or you might have apnea. Apnea might be pathological from brain or it's uh, from might be um, a neurology or neuromuscular disorders or it might be because of respiratory depression because of medication of or prematurity. When we stop resuscitation, before we usually stop after 10 minutes of not registering or recording a heart rate. Now in NRB edition eight, it's been changed to 20 minutes. And why? Because they found that having the heart rate after 10 minutes, before 20 minutes, show the same complications when we get the heart rate before 10 minutes. There is no extra complication, but the survival rate is higher. And that is the reason why we extend the resuscitation to be 20 minutes from the last recorded heart rate. and we should have no heart rate, and of course, there is no respiratory effort. When we stop resuscitation, now it depends on the uh, state regulation, depend on your country, on your city, on your facility, and so on, but the decision always needs to be discussed with uh, a parent, and it's the safe to resuscitate and transfer to an ICU and make the decision in an ICU. Of course, again, it depends on your organization policy and the state policy. Uh, we don't resuscitate usually a baby less than 22 weeks, maybe baby with a huge multiple malformation such as thalanotrophic dysplasia. Um, we don't, but even when we withhold, we have to provide comfort care, you know, controlling pain, providing sugar, providing oxygen and so on. What is golden hour? Golden hour is the first hour after the zero time. So in the trauma, it's after the, and the golden hour in a trauma patient is to prevent the secondary injury after the primary injury. Same in a newborn, golden hour is implemented to prevent the injury that human being do to the newborn. So it's practicing all the evidence 
based intervention for term in Britain baby. And as I said, it's adopted from adult trauma that usually adopted to prevent the secondary injury caused by human being. It has a very good evidence to improve the survival and improve the, you know, decrease the complications, the major complications in a Britain baby, less in term baby. However, it's globally accepted to practice the golden hour for both uh, 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 term and Britain baby. Their colleagues, I cannot read texting. So if you want to say something, you please raise your hand and say it. I cannot read. Okay. So how we do golden hour? We need a certified people in resuscitation with NRP or other equivalent programs. We need at least two skilled physician. We need at least two skilled nurses with an RT, or if we don't have an RT, we might be, need three nurses. So this is an example of a resuscitation room that we do a golden hour. And you can see it's a very well equipped with conventional and high frequency jet. I know in, in Middle East and many other countries, there is no jet. And you can see that it's, um, you know, the resuscitator is actually an incubator and it's open. You can see the label and, you know, the monitor that you can use as video record. You can see the other side, you can see the forms, you can see the blankets and you can see the towels, you can, you can see the transport crash card and everything is subtle. You can see the label to help calculating and um, con um, the doses. Um, you can see um, another bed, you can see the trolley that contain the equipment, another uh, uh, conventional uh, ventilator monitors. Um, you can see the access also another you can see the seats. You can see the portable. Can you please, yeah, Dr. Yahya Zaid, mute yourself. Um, so um, uh, you can see the transport and the parking uh, area of the uh, transport uh, uh, x-ray. You can see portable uh, supplies uh, for each system labeled and checked, uh, you know, and the doses and everything. So you don't have to, if you don't have time, you can see that um, each area is for one system and everything is there. And you can see it's movable, so you can move it anywhere you want. And it's always being checked. There is a person responsible to check it every day. You can see our transport uh, incubator contain, you know, conventional jet, nitric oxide, oxygen supply. You can see the bag, you can see infusion pumps, monitors, even now it have an echo and you can see it's motorized. And now we've changed it that uh, 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 you can now drive it. You can have a seat and drive it. And also you can drive it with a mobile. Yes, Dr. Sam, ask me. Yes, Dr. Sam, you are asking a question? Yes, Dr. Yeah, please, go ahead. Alaykum uh, doctor, how to give a dose of uh, caffeine drugs? Oh, the caffeine you give it, um, it depend if you have a caffeine straight or caffeine base. So if it's a caffeine citrate, it's a 20 milligram per kg and it's an IV and it should start or hit the, so you need, if you're expecting a baby less than 32 weeks, you mostly need it. So you have to uh, ask your obstetrician, what is the expected weight? And you have to calculate the dose based on the expected weight. And then you have to calculate the dose. And then the, you put it in an infusion pump and you have to prime it. So all the, the drug should be in the, uh, in, in the tube. So, um, uh, so once you get the IV, and always in my practice, we try two peripheral IVs. And if we got it, we start usually. So your target to start within 20 minutes and it should be ready before delivery if you have time. And if you don't, then other person should prepare it. So you make a list and prepare it. So if you have sod, uh, caffeine straight, you give 20 milligram per kg per dose and you give it over 20 minutes and it should be start before 20 minutes of life. 
and you should prime the circulation. So it should hit or start at the baby within 20 minutes of life. And then you go for maintenance, 10 milligrams after 24 hours, 20, 10 milligrams if you have ca caffeine straight. If you have caffeine base, you start with 10 milligram per kg per dose over 20, min over 20 minutes again, or and then within 20 minutes you start and hit the baby. And um, for my practice, and instead of five and 10, you know, five uh, base or 10 uh, citrate as a uh, continuous or maintenance dose, I start with half the dose, 2.5 or five. And the reason, because if the baby later on develop apnea, I give another dose and then I increase the dose to 10 if I have uh, caffeine straight or five if I have uh, caffeine base, and then I increase it. So, but if you start, 10 or five caffeine straight or caffeine base as a maintenance um, is acceptable practice. But me, I give half the dose just in case uh, baby need. And because there is evidence that it might, uh, might increase the possibility of next. So I start uh, lowest possible dose. Thank you, doctor. Most welcome. Now, the most important when you do a, a resuscitation is you have a checklist. And you can see this checklist uh, is prior delivery. And you can see that nursing have a checklist and the RT. And if you don't have RT, then you can add it to the nurse and they do the checklist. And one of it, you see the medication that Dr. Sam was asking about. So you do a checklist. And then when babies uh, less than uh, 27 weeks, you can see that it's yellow checklist, okay? Um, so you add to the checklist that you, any baby more than 27, there is chest leg. But when the baby less than 27, that's mean 23, 24, 25, 26, you have extra checklist. When the delivery is imminent, and I can provide you with a checklist, you know, a good copy if you guys want, um, uh, with the checklist that, you know, when the delivery is imminent, there is a short checklist. So you can see nursing checklist, RT checklist, if no RT, no respiratory therapist, you can add it to the nurse and there is a doctor checklist. If you are uh, less than 27, you have another checklist. And then you have checklist at 15 minutes for each gestation at 30 minutes and at 60 minutes. And you can see that uh, When the chest leg, ch checklist uh, for uh, this gestation, but the delivery is imminent, we have the short type of checklist. And then you can see the golden hour time frame. So I'm going to go a little bit in details for golden hour time frame. So uh, this is, I developed it myself. It's been six years. And uh, because I posted in Facebook, there are some, unfortunately, from UK, uh, took it without my permission and posted. And, uh, and they are from Royal College and, you know, unfortunately they didn't get my permission because this I developed it like six years old. So you can see in this golden hour, you can see we do antenatal consult prior delivery. We give antenatal steroid, we control temperature and we control any risk factors. Once the delivery happens, then we go for delay cortical clamping between 30 seconds to two minutes. We should start CPAP. And it's best to have variable flow CPAP within two minutes. Then you should insert peripheral IV within 10 minutes and the sugar should hit the baby. So you calculate the dose, 80 ml per kg per day, then divide it by 24 hours from the expected weight that the obstetrician will tell you. Um, and you should prime it and you know be ready within 10 minutes. And your uh, uh, caffeine should start within 20 minutes. Your sepsis workup, you can wait until two hours. And you can see the surfactant is not important because most people, they want to intubate and give surfactant. These are least important. And if you don't follow this, you probably, you won't have a good survival rate. Oh, so that's what we call it golden hour in the first 60 minutes. So doing the best for the baby to prevent complications such as hypothermia, hypoglycemia, apnea. So this prevent apnea, this prevent apnea, this and this prevent hypoglycemia. 
This prevent hypothermia and this minimize the complications and this minimize complication. The substance workup and starting antibiotics is not important and giving surfactant is not important for resuscitation. And then we go for gentle care. Gentle care mean don't do unnecessary thing. So baby is 30 weeks, but he's not in distress. No need for x-ray. Baby is 33 weeks and he's feeding and no need for IV. You don't need to check the gas frequent. So think if you actually need see a gas. So if you need an imaging to check the line or you have a respiratory distress, it's best to do with lung point of care ultrasound. But if you don't have, you can do an X-ray and the X-ray they expected from order to doing the X-ray should be within 20 minutes. Now, when you decide to give surfactant, you need about 20 minutes to warm it. You cannot put the surfactant in a warmer. You have to hold it. You cannot shake it and you, know, you cannot uh, rock it. You have to hold it by your hand until it warm up to the room temperature. So remember the body temperature is uh, uh, 36.5 to 37.5. And the surfactant temperature should be room temperature, which is 19 to 25 degrees Celsius. So remember here, if you cannot do good, but don't do harm, please. That's what we call it gentle care. So these are the two hours checklist, but we also we have transport checklist and arrival to an ICU checklist. So this is the transport checklist and the arrival and ICU chest is saturation, sugar level, temperature by rectum. So again, saturation, sugar level, temperature. So if you want to practice and improve your survival rate, target this, normal sugar level, normal saturation, normal temperature on arrival, not intubating and giving surfactant. After you finish resuscitation, you do debriefing. What went well? What are the barriers of doing delivery in the room? Room temperature, day later clamping, obstetrician not cooperating, nurses have problem. We don't have communication. We don't have transport. We have a problem of giving surfactant. How we give surfactant, open or closed, double lumen, single lumen, Lisa or uh, insure, whatever. Do we have checklist? Any suggestion, any comment? And then we can do recommendations and questions for the administration. So gentle care after resuscitation, less harm, best benefit, avoid blood work, avoid bolluses. Do IVH bundle to avoid IVH ble um, the bleeding. Noise, light control. Do cluster of care. So do everything one time, changing diaper, feeding, examining. Remember, babies need to sleep. And I always give this example. If you are, or you want to sleep and somebody call you at 12 midnight, then you want to sleep back and then somebody called you at 2 a.m. Then you want to sleep back again and somebody called you at 5 a.m. So next day you will not able function. So imagine we're doing this for babies. So sleeping is important in survival. Babies die because you are not allowing them to sleep. So if you want a good outcome, 23, 24, 25, you need a sleeping time at least 11 hours a day. Temperature control. Sugar control or arrival to an issue. Use pressure limited volume targeted ventilation. Give surfactant by Lisa. Use variable flow syrup, not constant flow syrup. Aggressive early feeding. Use EPM or donor breast milk. Achieve birth weight by day seven. And avoid X-ray, use point of care ultrasound. And thank you very much. And I am done with my presentation and I will be happy to take questions. 
But please, question by talking, not by texting. Questions? No questions? Wow. Alaykum as Yes, go ahead, sir. Assalamu alaykum. Alaykum as Dr. Hala. Dr. Okay, Dr. Yahya, thank you a lot for this um, NRP resuscitation. I want to ask you about uh, meconium. Uh, if a baby is meconium and vigorous, can it stay with mom and suction and yani routine care? No need for do the initial step. Well, first for meconium, you do not need to suction. That's first. No need to suction a meconium. Oh, okay. Whether okay. it's a vigorous or non-vigorous, you don't need to suction. You suction oh, okay. only nose and mouth. That's one. Uh, okay. Second, if you want a suction, only two indications. You have a chest movement, but there is no air entry, or you want to intubate and you don't see. So whether you have meconium or you don't have meconium, you do not suction. Now, uh, I want to tell you how the suction started. Now, the suction started at uh, 1890 like about 120 years ago. So how they were suctioning, they were holding the baby from the leg and then they were circling like this. So with the movement, the, they thought that the surfactant will go away. And then uh, uh, the surfactant or the meconium caused many pathological or pathophysiological problems. First one caused obstruction. Second, caused irritation and pneumonitis. Third, neutralize surfactant and cause, you know, atelectasis. And fourth, it's a, a cause immunological reaction because it's a foreign body. And fifth, uh, uh, it can cause infection. However, these are all inside the airway. In the major airway or in the upper airway, the baby will cough it out if he's breathing. So the evidence showed that suctioning will not change the outcome, such as you know, the respiratory distress, the need for resuscitation, the pulmonary hypertension, you know, as a consequences of, of meconium. There was no change whether you suction or you don't suction. So there is no need to suction, whether there is blood or there is pus or there is meconium. Suctioning is not necessary only mouth and nose and position. And if you have a chest movement, but there is no air entry, consider suction, or you want to intubate and you don't see. Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. Uh, another question, Dr. Yahya. Go About ahead. naloxone, naloxone now is not used. Naloxone. Yes. Now in uh, the new guidelines. Why, where, where, where you use naloxone? Like what no, are no, the indications? Not no, no, I know, but I'm that. asking you, what is the indication of naloxone? يعني إحنا كنا زمان نستخدمه على أساس أنتيدوت for pitocin. If the mother, if the mother take pitocin within two hours before labor. Okay, so uh, I will tell you what is the indication. So naloxone is indicated when you have narcotics that cause respiratory depression. Depression. So you give naloxone to uh, resume the respiration. Now, the problem with that, the indication for naloxone, first, the baby should not be a premature because there is a report of death, cardiac arrest, uh, in babies less than 29 weeks. That's one. Second, giving naloxone will make the people more confident, especially those with experience to not provide effective ventilation. So first, you should the baby have more than 29 weeks. Second, the baby should have effective ventilation. Third, the mother should be on narcotics at least four hours prior delivery, or the baby receive narcotics such as fentanyl, for purpose, let's say, of intubation. So these are the indication for giving naloxone. 
So from my experience, if you can provide effective ventilation, 99%, you will not need ventilation, naloxone. No need. And that's why they removed the naloxone from the medication of an RP. Because there is a report, it caused cardiac arrest. Second, it delay resuscitation. Especially found those experts. And, and uh, you know, we are in the era of evidence-based medicine and also physiological-based medicine. And do you know how I define uh, experience? I know. Can you, def can you define experience? In our experience now, not used now. You know, what is experience? The word experience. Can you define it? I don't understand what you... What is experience? I'm a neurologist and an RB instructor. Okay, so I will define an okay. uh, experience for you. It is the tendency to do the same mistake, but with more mm -hmm. confidence. This is experience. Okay. okay. Experience okay. is the tendency to give the same mistake, but with oh, more okay. confidence, you know? So, oh, okay. uh, yeah, so we always have to practice. No experience in medicine now. You have always to practice evidence-based medicine or physiological-based medicine. And then you come the experience. Okay. Okay. So Thank you. be careful of using naloxone in resuscitation. That would, I would say. No, no, no not used in, uh, in resuscitation. No, no, I, I use it. Move for, I, um, I use, use it. it yeah, if in the um, case, so, yeah, so for example, uh, I intubated like one, one month ago, I intubated the baby okay. and uh, the baby was fighting. Uh -huh. So I gave mm -hmm. RSI, so I gave fentanyl, succinylcholine, fentanyl. and uh, atropine, and the baby was not breathing for, uh, you know, after ventilation for a long period of time. So either I have to keep the baby on ventilator or mm -hmm. uh, extubate the baby. So I gave naloxone and I extubated the baby. So sometime, sometime you can, sometime you can, you can use, use it. Use, uh, yeah. yeah, I can. But always I use it to an ICU, during, not during resuscitation. Oh, okay. And the NBICU yeah. also. And in ICU, yeah, you can ICU. use it. You can use it in PIC, of course. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Yes, salam alaikum. Salam. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Go ahead, thank you so much for this uh, very good presentation. Uh, my, my first question: uh, If we receive a tiny baby, for example, less than eight hundred grams, one hundred grams, and initially he is doing well, he is not in distress. Is it better to give surfactant in this time or wait uh, for a while till be distressed or uh, deciding? Okay. So giving uh, surfactant, should, yeah, I will tell you, giving surfactant should be based on a surfactant tool. So you divide the babies to two groups, those intubated and those not intubated. So babies less than 29 weeks, 50% of them will be intubated. And 50% of them will not be intubated. So if you are less than 30 weeks and intubated, you have to give surfactant. But the surfactant yeah. has to be given in a control environment between 30 minutes and six or you know two hours. So if you are less than 30 and intubated for other reasons, you have to give surfactant. If you are not intubated and you are less than 30 weeks, or less than 1500 grams, you have to use other factors. Okay, so if you get two of the following, FiO2, more than 40%, for more than 15 minutes, with CPAP, more than eight centimeter water. So that's one. FiO2, okay. more than 40% with CPAP more than eight centimeter water and you are not intubated and you are less than 30 weeks. Second, X-ray or lung ultrasound finding of RDS. Third, okay. CO2 more than 60. Fourth, pH less than 7.2. <coughs> if you have okay. two of these, you need to give surfactant. And if you start caffeine and the baby is breathing, you can give it with LISA or less invasive surfactant therapy. So if you don't want to give it as a LISA, <clears throat> you can give it as insure, which means intubate, give surfactant, extubate. Now the definition of insure in my practice is 
the tube in the upper airway for less than 30 minutes. If it's more than 30 minutes, this is not insured. So you need to give surfactant and then you need to decide with hand ventilation or with ventilator, with or without medication, uh, single lumen or double lumen, open or closed method, because open method associated with more you know, complications. So you need to do a closed method. And if you go to my channel, you will see, find all these type of how you give surfactant. So if you are more than 30 weeks and you are intubated for other reasons, you have to have risk factors, same. So you are intubated more than 30 weeks, you need two of risk factors that I list. If you are more than 30 weeks and you are not intubated, okay. you don't need surfactant. Yes, I Is got it. Okay. Actually, in practice, we found something, some exceptions. Uh, it depends on the situation. Uh, sometimes if the baby developed hypothermia during a station like this, he will be he will deteriorate rapidly. At the time we decide to intubate, uh, what I mean, there is uh, some cofactors or uh, uh, any other association uh, no, rather sir. than sir. Are, are there. Sir, yes. sir. First, yes. first, first during resuscitation, the baby. Wait, wait, let me answer you. First, okay. during resuscitation, the baby should not develop hypothermia. If the baby develops hypothermia, you have a big problem in your resuscitation. Now, hypothermia is the effect of hypothermia on the body is more than RDS and congenital heart disease and asphyxia. So if you have yes. hypothermia, babies less than 29 weeks will not survive in your unit. So I never had a hypothermia in last 24 months because I am obsessive, obsessive about controlling the temperature during resuscitation. Second, yeah, as I told you, you have to control the sugar of the baby because if you don't give sugar, because remember the placenta give continuous sugar to the baby about four to eight milligram per kg per minute. And the baby has no store. And within 12 minutes, you will start to have hypoglycemic encephalopathy. Yeah. So giving sugar is vital before you know, intubation. And giving caffeine is important before intubation. And starting CPAP, is important before intubation. Antenatal steroid okay. is important. Delay cord clamping and controlling body temperature. So these okay. are projects that you work on. Mm -hmm. Arrival sugar level, arrival to an ICU, arrival temperature, arrival okay. saturation. Birth weight should return by day seven. Because remember, okay. when the baby born at 24 weeks, you have only 5% of the lung. So even if you injure the lung and the baby start to grow, you'll have a new lung. Because already you are injured, only you injured yeah. or damaged, only 5%, you still have 95%. How do you achieve 95%? By growing. And how you do that? TBN, aggressive feeding. Yeah. So I don't feeding. move a baby. I don't, you remember, did you know that I start yeah. feeding before giving surfactant? I start feeding really? in 23 weeks before I give surfactant. So for oh, me, the feeding is Karen. more important than surfactant. Uh, Dr. Yahya, excuse me, you started feeding or TPN before surfactant? Feeding. Enteral. Feeding, enteral feeding, you mean? or, or Enteral feeding, yes, feeding, milk. By NG? By NG, yes. Okay. Well, I, Doctor, you mean you start Unfortunately, we are not. What, 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 we are not one, by one, one by one. One by one. One by one. One by one. So can I, can I ask a more question? Go ahead, please. Uh, I, I want to know what are the maximum accepted uh, BCO2 in permissive hypercapnia? It depends on the gestation. So, uh, in the first day, I would accept up to 60 if the pH is more than 7.2. If after one week, I accept up to 70, if the pH is more than 7.2. So I don't increase setting if the pH is, unless it become 80. If the pH is more than 7.2, remember that. BCO2 okay, 80 up to, up to 80? 
Up at 80, I would start, you know, changing the setting, yes. But 70, in the first day, 60. So I go very extreme to prevent the damage. Uh, regard, regard to the, force, the four questions before delivery. Uh, if Mahmoud, there is, you uh, ask a lot. It's, let's, um, sorry, let's um, give sorry, the chance for others and we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Rehab, Dr. Rehab. Doctor, I also have a question. Uh, Doctor, about uh, starting feeding and gave you, uh, giving caffeine at the same time, isn't there any, any risk for NEC, for neck? Um, you have a premature baby, you are going to give caffeine and you want to start enteral feeding. No, I, do both. I do both. Um, uh, there is always risk, but the, you know, having neck is better than having death. So. Mm, so you start, let's say, with yeah, I start feed. MEF, by the way, MEF, minimal enteral feed, not feed. Yes. MEF, for the first three days, I start MEF. <laughs> Aggressive feeding mean early feeding. Aggressive feeding yes. mean early feeding. So if the baby qualified for MEF, I go for MEF. And if the baby is not qualified for MEF, I start feeding. So I use aggressive feeding mean you have a standard feeding protocol for you know specific gestation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Dr. Pauline, she was asking question. Pauline, right? Yes, uh, Doctor. My first question is, what 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 glucose would you recommend to use in the first twenty four hours of those small term babies? Dextrose, D10, D10, D10. not D5. No, no, okay, no, I'll... never, never. Okay. The minimum, okay, the I'll... minimum sugar intake, the minimum sugar mm. intake should be yes. five milligram per kg per minute. If you give less than five milligram per kg per minute, your brain start to suffer, what we call it glucopenia. So to prevent glucopenia, you need five milligram per kg per minute. So if your baby, let's say one kilogram, and you're giving 80 mil per kg per day of D10, we can calculate me and you, right? So yes. 80 times 10 divided by 100, this is 80 gram times 1,000, yes. this is 8,000, divided by 24, divided 24. by 60, you will get milligram per kg per minute. So if you give D5, then you will not able, and if you give more fluid in the first day, you will open the PDA. So you have to oh, give okay. concentration. So if you your sugar is low, you can, you should go, you don't increase the volume, you go to D12.5. If you need more than D12.5 to achieve five milligram per kg per minute, up to 10 milligram per kg per minute, uh, you can go to D15, but you should have a central line. So after D12.5, you need a central line. And now if you need D15, D20, D25, if you need more than D25, then you have a problem because you don't start TPN. Remember when you start um, so I start uh, TBN, uh, or what do I call it, TBN standard, that's mean only protein, I start at the labor room. So I start when I said 80 mil per kg per day, I divide it to two. 40 mil per kg per day, D10, and 40 is protein. The reason, because when you give a protein, first, you will prevent changing glucose to other, and second, protein help better digestion of glucose. So you can see that the incidence okay. of hypoglycemia is way better when you start early okay. uh, protein. Not only that, when you give MEF at birth, you uh, um, um, the secretin and uh, the uh, cholecystokinin help to control the sugar better. So starting feeding very early, if you have EBM or DBM, Mm. is very important uh, because it's helped to control the sugar. And starting TBN early also, it's helped to control the sugar. And that way you will eat, need less glucose. But I would always go with the maximum glucose because the glucose gives you very good uh, calories. And in the first day, 
the best scenario, if you can give 100 kilocalorie per kg per day. So no, I went from a neonatal resuscitation to neonatal care. So I don't want to do that. Let's concentrate it about, let's concentrate about resuscitation. Any more questions? Okay, doctor, yes. Doctor, uh, thank you so much. My other question is about, uh, do you use amino acids? And uh, when, do you, when do you start to give those to your babies? If you do. Amino acid formula, you mean? No, 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 no. IV. Yeah, as protein. infusion. The protein, yeah. Yes, uh, as protein, uh, yeah. At birth. Once I get the IV, I start. Yeah, immediately I start. I give a TPN starter, as I told you, which is only amino acid, only protein. Um, because okay. if the baby, we usually we order TPN at 9 a.m. and we get the TPN at 4 p.m. So if the baby born, let's say, um, at 2, 2 p.m., then we'll have 26 hours until next TPN will come. So we have what we call a yeah. TPN starter at the unit. So we started right away, just protein. Next day, I order standard TPN, which contain the glucose, the amino acid, uh, uh, the uh, fat, the uh, electrolyte, the trace element, the multivitamin, the fat soluble vitamins. This will take time. So if the baby born, uh, because I order at 9 a.m., if the baby born at midnight, midday, yeah, 12 noon, I won't have TPN. Sometime I'm lucky, yeah. I can contact the TPN room to get me, give me the TPN, but sometimes I'm not lucky. So what I do is the baby born after 2 p.m., 2, 3, 5, uh, 4 a.m., I start TPN starter, or what you call it, amino acid, um, you know, such as amino van. So what I do is I give 40, 40, 40 sugar, and I always take the additives or the extra fluids such as you know antibiotics because all should be from ah. within the 80 ml per kg per day um, and as i told you starting protein will control the sugar and you will need less glucose exactly like the feeding when you start feeding you will get better sugar control and you will need less glucose thank any you more so questions? much doctor. thank you so much any more questions Dr. Yahya, is it uh, yes. necessary to check the weight of the baby? Uh, I mean, the newborn in a resuscitation or just I, yes. I give them medic medications yes. depends on the rapid weight. So what we do is we do uh, use expected weight if we cannot weigh the baby, but we have to weigh the baby one time. And then we do what we call it IVH bundle. So you put the baby in midline, we avoid noise, we avoid light, we avoid bolluses. We avoid movement. We give good sedation to avoid VH44 uh, for three to five days. So in the second, third, and fourth, we don't weigh the baby. We weigh only one time. And we start weighing the baby by day four or day five. Um, um, uh, because most of the baby anyhow will lose weight and they will not come back until you're doing very good to achieve the birth weight by day seven. So yes, we, we use the expected weight uh, until we weigh the baby. And when we weigh the baby, we use working weight. So usually what I do is if the weight, let's say 1,090 gram, I use 1.1. If the weight 1,070, I use 1.1. If the weight is 960, I use one kilo. So I, we have something called uh, expected weight, uh, daily weight and working weight. So I always you know, approximate the weight to use it. So I use expected weight, so if the, obstetrician told me it's a 750, I use 0.8. And if he told me 620, I use 0.7. And then I check the weight. And then again, I change my working weight uh, and I keep same working weight until day four or day five where I check the weight. And I will use the same working weight until the new weight exceed the, my working weight. And I always approximate the weight. I use one kilo, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. That's my, so I can, and then I calculate everything on the new weight. Questions? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Welcome. Doctor. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Doctor, for these uh, very nice uh, presentations. Uh, please, I want to. Uh, I uh, I have one question regarding the nutrition of the babies. I noticed that uh, many babies uh, during uh, respiratory distress or tachypnea or something like that, uh, the baby keep, uh, have been kept uh, MPO for uh, two, three days. Is it uh, correct to keep baby MPO for this long time? Or okay, I well, have you to... You tell me, is it correct? Can I keep you fasting for three days? 
I don't think I corrected. Yani, but I saw no, it's that. not correct, mom. You don't need. Feeding is more important than intubation. Feeding is more important than surfactant. Feeding is more important than antibiotics. Feeding is more important than the lines. Feeding is more important than even if yeah. you're dying. I yeah. would be happy to die, you know, even when you execute a person, they ask him what meal you want to take. So sorry, I would doctor, have, if even we, if you are resuscitated, go ahead, sorry. So, sorry, doctor, if we are in surrounding, no, we don't have the MBN. So how I deal with the baby and how I feed the you baby? You don't have TBN? No. Yeah, so start feeding. Uh, some uh, senior doctor they told that uh, if we start uh, feeding and the baby is the kidney, so uh, may I cause aspiration for the baby? No, you should not cause aspiration. No way. That is incorrect. Feeding okay. will never cause aspiration. How much feeding you will give first day? One mil, two mil. Yeah. So, and if you use DBM or EBM, even if you aspirate, it won't cause any problem. Mm. Thank you very much. That, that is incorrect. No, you have to be. And the question is uh, from, it's in Arabic. Uh, if you are the only doctor and you don't have cannula, oh, you use glucogel. So if you cannot have an IV access, so you have to give a glucogel. Now the indication of a glucogel, so they are tubes and you can buy it from the market. They are tubes, 50%. Uh, 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 so the dose is 200 milligram per kg or 0.5 uh, mil per kg. And uh, in my practice, the nurses can give it even if there is no doctor and they are allowed to give it for twice. And if the baby persistent hypoglycemia, then they call for help. So if you don't have an IV access or you don't want to do IV access, you can give glucogel. Now the glucogel is indicated for babies more than 35 weeks. But sometime, even if I cannot get the access, uh, even if low, so I would say, you know, side effect of neck because of using high concentration formula, the bowels, or the baby die from hypoglycemia. So sometime, even if it's not indicated in my, I, I give a glucogel. So the question, this the question for Dr. Nada asking if I don't have IV access. Any more questions? Yes, doctor. Tell uh, me. My other question is uh, how- uh, Sorry, how Pauline, I wanna ask you, Dr. Pauline, where do you practice? Uh, I'm in Uganda. Oh, Uganda. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, my question is, if a baby develops necrotizing enterocolitis, for how long should you keep them nail per oral? Oh, that's very good question. So um, I don't know how old are you, but I'm a very old person. So um, before 2000, we used to keep the baby MPO for neck for 21 days. Then right. the evidence escalate, and in 2010, we start to keep MPO for 14 days. And uh, okay. because the, uh, the evidence further escalate, right now we have to decide to keep the baby MPO between five days and 14 days, uh, depending okay. on many factors. So um, okay. it's always good practice if you're during night, you are feeding intolerance or suspicion of neck and uh, you keep the MPO. Then you come in the morning and do the round and assess the baby. If you have neck, you have to keep the baby MPO. Now you have to decide the bell staging, the stage of your neck. And then you decide for how long you keep the baby MPO. But maximum should be 14 days and minimum five days if you have a confirmed neck. If you don't have confirmed okay. neck, you have to resume feeding. Even if you have a bleeding uh, due to gastritis or cow's milk allergy, you have to resume feeding. The only indication of keeping MPO is one, internal obstruction. Two, okay. neck. Three, neck. if you have two inotropes. So if your baby on two inotropes, it's really better to keep the baby MPO. But if you have okay. no neck, no confirmed neck, second, no internal obstruction, and you are on less than two inotropes, feeding should not be stopped. The best thing okay, to do for a baby is to feed. Feed, 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 and feed. A good neonatologist will feed the baby. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Any more questions? 
Okay, if no questions, then I have to end this. Yes, Doctor. This last ahead, question, please. please. Uh, we Go can ahead. give formula if we don't have EBM. So um, that's a good question. Now the formula. Um, so it depends. Are you giving MEF? Depend. If the baby is less than 1,500 gram and you want to give feed, so you have three options: uh, okay. DPM or EBM. That's first question. So if you have no EBM, you can ask any donor, anyone in the unit. That's what I do. Uh, please, I have a baby. I want to milk. So can you give me some? Can I borrow some of your milk? Because one of the mothers are feeding one month babies. They have lots of milk. And what do you need? You need like one mil every four hours or one mil every, you need always 12 mil, very small amount. So I go and borrow it from the mother. And then I ask the mother of this baby to have a deal with the other mas as they are brothers in milk because we are in a Muslim country. So that's what I yes. do. So yes. ABM or DBM. And I never ever faced a situation where I cannot get the donor plus. Most of people want to help. So that's one. So if you don't have donor, okay. then you can buy milk from markets. So now there is fatwa from Azhar, from Shia, from Sunnah, yeah. from Lebanon, from KSA, and from Persia. I have a fatwa of using donor breast milk. So if the insurance company cover, because it's very expensive, it costs about, I think, $2,000 a month, to give donor breast milk, you know, from Prolacta or from Huwaba. So that's another option. If you don't have all this, then you go for formula. So when you give formula, you have to give term formula. If you want to give e, uh, EMF, okay. it should be term formula, not preterm formula. Once after three days, you switch to feeding, you go to preterm. If you don't have, then you can give D5. But okay. never stop feeding. Thank so you. If you don't have milk, you can give D5 as a feed. So you give D5, one mil every four hours, depending on the weight, or one mil every two hours. And then you wait for three days um, if you're doing MEF. If you're not doing MEF, once you start feeding, before you increment, check the feed for, like, let's say you five mil every two hours or every three hours, and then wait 24 hours before you check to increase. So that's what I do. And then I start to increase five mil every other feed. You know, it depends on, I have feeding protocols for each weight, and then I go accordingly. Thank you, doctor. You're most welcome. Any more questions? It's been two hours, so I think um, I'm done. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And I'm very happy that at this point, we have 75 audience. And, you know, that, that was incredible. Thank you very much for attending. And tomorrow, we have the second session of resuscitating a child. Um, so we did the first session, and tomorrow we have the, um, the second session of we will have five sessions of how to resuscitate a child. So for those interested, they can join. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Wish you all the best. Keep helping the baby and having a lovely night. Bye-bye. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Wa alaikum assalam. Bye-bye.